Good morning everybody and uh, we're continue, continuing our series on Mark's Gospel and just to remind you that uh, we're not uh, going through every bit of Mark but we're trying to pick out significant pieces of the information Mark gives in his Gospel that uh, enable us to see that Mark is trying to portray that Jesus is the Son of God and he was on a mission. Mark's Gospel is uh, different from the other Gospels. We believe it was the first Gospel to be written and used by the Christian Church. It's quite short and to the point. It's where we're looking at um, one instance of Jesus casting out demons this week and opposition coming from the church leaders of the time. And this is a specific effort that Mark puts in it. He wants us to be clear that Jesus came, he started his mission, he rose to enormous popularity. Crowds were coming from all over the place to hear him, to be healed by him. And then this is the first incident that we see that there is opposition to Jesus' ministry. Jesus has chosen his message, he's chosen his disciples, he's going about ministering in uh, Galilee, in the northern part of Israel. People were drawn to him and see that he's teaching and talking with amazing authority, something they've never heard or seen before. But now, opposition is beginning to dwell up. And uh, this is what we're going to go about today. So, we're going to read some selected verses from Mark's Gospel. Crowds follow Jesus. Jesus withdrew his disciples to the lake and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all that was go doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idium, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told the disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that when his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Bezalzebub, by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth. All the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. 
He said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and my mother. So, I've entitled this week, Jesus Under Pressure. He's under pressure because he couldn't get away from the crowds. People were demanding his time. They were demanding to see him. Lots of people are coming up, bringing their friends to be healed. And Jesus, even to talk to the crowds now, had to get into boats and get off the lakeside, into the water a bit, to keep the crowds away from him where he couldn't teach. The pressure was endless. And he even took to going up into the hills overnight on his own to pray and be alone with God in order that he could be rejuvenated to carry on his work. So he's under stress and he's under pressure. And I expect many of us here have felt like that at one time or another. And the only way to do that, to stop that, is to take time out. But in generally speaking, of course, it's not good for us. And then, on top of all this, his family arrives on the scene. We believe he's in Capernaum, which is a couple of, two or three hours walk from Nazareth. His family turn up because obviously they're worried in one way or another. And they come out with some strange sayings. Well, we need to take him back. We need to take him out of here. Is he doing too much? Has he had a breakdown? Because obviously at this time, Criticism is coming. And we know from the story we get from all the Gospels that back in Nazareth, Jesus wasn't seen in the same light as other parts of Galilee. How must he felt when his mother and brothers turned up criticising his ministry and in a way trying to get him back out of his mind? That must have hurt, surely. We all have to stand up to personal criticism from time to time. You know, we might be trying to do something unpopular at work and, uh, you know, that's uh, created an atmosphere of criticism there or in other areas of our life, in church life sometimes. If we're trying to push something through that not everybody agrees with, we can all end up being criticised and we have to deal with that. And we cope. But if criticism's coming from your own family, that must have been worrying. It must have created a lot of personal pain in Jesus' life. And this is what he's now up against. Everything's been going well. But now Jesus is back under pressure. And the Pharisees and the scribes from Jerusalem turn up. And he has to deal with that. And he deals with it in a special way. He doesn't talk to them about the scriptures. He tries to talk to them about common sense of their arguments. Why did they turn up? Well, it can only be one reason that the, the local leaders were getting worried about how popular Jesus was becoming. 
and how people were turning up to listen to him in their hundreds and in their thousands. And the leaders had sent to Jerusalem headquarters for help. We need your help. We've got this prophet on our hands and we can't deal with it. Must have been the reason that these scribes and Pharisees turned up from Jerusalem and I expect they had a conclave with the local leaders there and they said, well, we've tried this, we've tried that. And, uh, you know, it hasn't worked. The crowd still believe Jesus because he's healing these people and he's clearing out these evil spirits that people are struggling with. And so they come up with this tactic, I suppose, of accusing Jesus of being evil himself. Beelzebub was a nickname for the devil, the nickname for Satan. The word itself has got in origins in Canaanite religion and uh, it was a word that was used like a slang word would be used today. And so these religious leaders from Jerusalem, who we would have presumed are well educated, well versed in the scriptures and life, and with authority, start accusing him of being possessed by the devil himself. So these uh, teachers have walked an awful long way at the request of the local leaders to take on this new prophet. And so they accuse Jesus of being demon possessed and they accuse him of driving out demons by the power of demons. And Jesus turns around to them and says, basically, this is absolutely ridiculous. How could this be a logical argument? <coughs> How can Satan, if you're accusing me of being Satan, how come Satan's trying to heal these people who are possessed by demons? It doesn't make any sense. The logic of your argument is stupid. We don't see much, many people possessed by demons in our community at this time. But it does happen and we can come across it. And I have dealt with it in the past, in uh, other churches that I've been connected with over the years. And it's something that as Christians we can help people with. People usually end up being possessed by evil spirits, etc., because they've dabbled in things that are evil. They've dabbled in the occult. They've dabbled in witchcraft. And once you open up your life to those evil things that do exist in our community today, you put your life and your health at risk because they want to control you and everything about their control is not good. But people can be delivered with prayer and healing and accepting that Jesus has defeated evil when he went to the cross. Jesus was driving out these spirits and they couldn't deny that. But Jesus saying Satan wouldn't drive out his own spirits, otherwise he would defeat himself. It's a, it's a simple thing as that. What a silly argument you are using. And so he counters, if you like, these difficult things, not by quoting scripture that you may think, but by talking in a logical way.
Jesus was also trying to point out that of all the people around, it's Satan who is the accuser. Satan is the one who accuses us of bad things. He tries to do that to make us feel guilty about our life, our purposes, our beliefs. The scriptures remind us both Old and New Testament that the devil is the accuser and is the one who accuses us of false things. He's the one when we are weak that accuses us that we're not really saved, that we're not really going to heaven. He is the one who puts doubts in our lives. But Jesus is the one who can bring us comfort and assurance that this life is more than the years that we spend walking this planet. So as we look at this passage, why is it included? Why has Mark included this passage in his Gospels? The other two Gospel writers of Matthew and Luke don't give this much credence. They do mention it, but it's mentioned not so much in an exhilarating and forthright manner. And I think it's because Mark wants us to understand fully that if we are going to follow Jesus, then we are going to be accused by the evil one, just as Jesus was. If we're following Jesus and trying to live a life of good, following in his ways, keeping the commandments, in all these things then we are likely to be attacked and accused just like Jesus was. And so we need to be prepared for it. And it could often happen after we've not long come and taken that challenge of becoming Christians. This is the time that Satan comes to accuse us. Just like he started to use these Pharisees to accuse Jesus at the height of his ministry. And so Sometimes we need to be prepared to talk to our accusers, talk to our critics, not by quoting scripture at them, but by discussing things logically with them, and perhaps use illustrations too to prove them wrong. In a way, Jesus challenges us all to stand up where we are. Are we for him? Or are we for the evil one? This is what's happening here. This is what Mark is trying to get across in his gospel. If we want to become followers of Jesus, then we are opening up ourselves to be criticised. But the message of the gospel comes along is to say, well, don't worry about that. When we become Christians, we have the help of the Spirit and He will guide us in all things and help us to get over these criticisms. Criticisms are nothing to be worried about. The accusations of the evil one are not to be concerned. If we understand what's going on, then we can be prepared for those difficult times in our lives. And that's why it's important to be part of a Christian community, be part of a, a group together who can support each other, part of a fellowship, and of course, at times, we need to make sure we know the gospel story, we need to know what the Bible says about these things, and to get some understanding of the deeper issues of scripture that we can do by doing some reading and other things. The Apostle Paul says this, 
Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Jesus was being attacked by the religious leaders at the time because they feared him that he was going to take their power away. The religious leaders of Israel at this particular time were more about safeguarding their own positions in the community and their own income than they were about anything else. And somebody coming along like John the Baptist and Jesus talking about God in real terms and what it meant to serve him and know the love of God was not on their agenda. And when you get into that sort of mode, you can't see the wood for the trees. If you come in with such strong views and closed minds, then you will never see the truth of the gospel. We know that for today. But of course, what the teachers of the law were doing was distracting the crowd by attacking Jesus to from seeing the true love of God in the healing of these demon-possessed people. And in particular on this occasion, but it happens on other occasions, when they do that, the emphasis goes out of the healing love of God. This is what they're trying to do. They're trying to fraud Jesus' message, aren't they? That's a pure and straightforward way of looking at it. And that happens today. You know, as Christians, when we stand up for the truth of the Scriptures, then we're going to come across critics who want to prevent the good news of Jesus Christ coming across into our world. And this is what we have to deal with. We have to deal with these things quite simply in the same way that Jesus does. Because all the distractions and criticisms we get are trying to prevent us from following Christ ourselves. Satan, if you like, is trying to chip away, isn't he, at the foundations of the Christian faith in one way or another. All the t attacks on marriage and sexuality these days are all down to the accuser trying to distract us and distract others from learning the truth of how God wants us to live our lives. When we need to recognise and be confident that Jesus has overwhelmed the accusations of the devil through the cross. He obtained his victory. And we're in now this part of human history in the skirmishes of defeating Satan once and for all before we live in a new world and a new kingdom. One other thing that is brought out in this passage that I want to deal with this morning, from verse 28. I tell you the truth. All the sins and the blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. I've come across a number of people in my life who believe they've committed the unforgivable sin. And that Jesus will never forgive them for the sin that they've committed. I want to assure you this morning, if you read this verse and read it out of context and do understand the background to what Jesus is saying here, then you can't commit the unforgivable sin. I don't believe you can. Jesus in this passage is clearly directing these 
verses, these sayings to the leaders of the Jewish people. These Pharisees that come down from Jerusalem and accuse him of being demon possessed. Let's have a look at a few definitions of what the unforgivable sin says. The first one from the Dictionary of Biblical Things. The unforgivable sin, the willful, outward expressed and impenitent slander against the Holy Spirit when Jesus Christ's mighty works, clearly performed by the power of the Holy Spirit, are attributed to Satan, thus subjecting Christ to public disgrace. So we have here a definition that says that this was personal. Jesus was being accused in his human form in front of witnesses in this public arena. And Jesus is talking about they have committed the unforgivable sin. This is what's going on here. The Jewish leaders of the day in person accusing Jesus Christ in person on earth of being demon possessed. And they have no excuse for doing that. The Pharisees knew about the teaching of the Messiah or should have understood the teachings that God had given his people Israel about the coming Messiah. They should have done better than to accuse somebody who was coming to do the works of God, of healing and loving people. And they took the deliberate choice to put him down. Another definition here comes from a, a theological dictionary. Those who adamantly refuse to acknowledge the authenticity of Christ, Jesus' miracle work in powers, blaspheme the Holy Spirit by attributing his works to Satan, which is an unforgivable sin. Religious leaders frequently accuse Jesus of blasphemy because he claimed for himself the attitudes, rights and prerogatives of God, including the authority to forgive sins. So there's lots going on here. Many people, as I say, can fear that they've committed some sin that God cannot forgive them for, that Jesus cannot forgive them for. And I want to assure you this morning that you haven't committed any sins that you can't be forgiven for. And that should be a great encouragement to us all. The message of the Gospel is all about coming to Jesus and asking for his forgiveness. No matter what we've done. Jesus can forgive all our sins, all the wrongdoing, all the crimes we've committed. He may not be able to ch change the consequences of those sins or crimes we we've committed, but he can forgive us and we can be welcomed into God's kingdom if we truly repent and ask for his forgiveness. So I hope you are not suffering from a guilt today that believes that God cannot forgive all your sins, all the crimes you committed, or anything else. Because we come and worship a God who loves every single person, no matter what they've done, no matter how many times they've done it, he's always willing to accept you, if you're truly repentant, to want to change your ways and seek to work out that forgiveness, he will forgive you and you will be welcomed into the kingdom of God along with lots of other people who've never committed anything like the terrible sins that you've done. We are all acceptable into the kingdom on our level playing field.